happening, everyone. Today is a very special day, I believe. I think it's going to be a pretty baller stream. Go ahead and put it out there if you want to share it with other people so they can also enjoy the technical whirlwind that we're going to go through. It's definitely going to be a technical stream. I'm going to answer as many questions as I can, but I've got the code, the script, the GitHub kind of turned into a guide at some point. I hate calling it a guide because it's not really meant to be that extensive, but I kind of had to document a bunch of stuff around the script. I was like, okay, I should do a FAQ. So, you know, all these questions I keep seeing coming up, can, I can put in a you know, little bit of a simple answer if I know it. However, yeah, it's going to be interesting. So uh, yeah, put, uh, put it in the chat. We're going to do it Richard Hart. Can, can you hear me now live style before we get started? Put uh, my body is ready in the chat. If you can hear me, if you can hear me clear. If Mike doesn't suck, put, uh, put my body is ready in the chat. I'm, I'm excited for this stream. I, I literally woke up this morning. I was like, I should do a validator stream. I should do an AMA now that I got uh, the testnet V4 uh, stuff working on it, working beautifully, at least in my testing. I haven't had any bugs on the GitHub either. I just had a pull request from uh, Brett, one of the Pulse Chain devs, to uh, get rid of some of the ENR stuff, which apparently isn't needed in, uh, or isn't necessary at least, in V4. So that was cool. Besides that, everything's going good. I need to see at least 10. My body is ready before we continue. So it's up to you. It's up to you how quickly you want to get started. I'm just going to get on Twitter in the meantime. Let's see what's going on. I was going to look something up real quick to make sure my stuff is prepped and ready. <laughs> yeah, it's always good. It's always cool to get a pull request from a Pulse Chain dev. Pretty cool. I mean, nothing. It didn't even have anything to do with the code, really. I mean, it actually still is in the code in the script, but yeah, it was just a documentation uh, pull pull request, which I merged yesterday after I saw it. So shout out to Bree Tep on Twitter, Brett Tep and Pulsing. Let's see. <laughs> crypto Vents. You're trying to cheat, Crypto Vents. You're trying to cheat. I like it, though. I like it. I like it. I still need seven more, everyone. It's up to you. It's up to you when you want this thing to start. It's up to you. I'll go through the comments while we're talking about it, though. Be mindful of love, says God help us. Yes, we can use all the help we, we can get every way, shape, or form from whoever, whatever benevolent wells and gods you believe in. Tell them, tell them, tell them to uh, give us all that prosperity. We'll take it. Oi, oi. Actually, somebody said, uh, I was talking to somebody about crypto, a real life friend of crypto the other day. And he told me good luck. I was like, I literally, my response was literally, I don't need luck. I literally told him that. It was funny. And he laughed it off, but I was like, I'm serious. So, I mean, we, it was, it was, you know, it wasn't like an awkward moment or anything. It was just like, that was my auto response to good luck. It was like, you know, you, I make my own luck. Everyone can make their own luck being sensitive to good opportunities. Uh, you know, time, diligence, hard work, you make your own luck. So uh, just want to make that point across. Old Surrey Git 06. My phone gave me a nuclear attack warning. I pulled you just, uh, I wouldn't hold my breath. Probably still got a couple more weeks, tongue in cheek. What's up, UFO to go? Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Paul said you were sloppy. It's, it's uh, uh, you know, never, what is the, uh, not you, what is the uh, one that used to be in the movies all the time? It was always the uh, Chechen, Chechen terrorist. Used to be in the movies all the time. That's so funny. Yep, that's right. Red Squirrel, what's up, man? Good to see you. Good to see you. The Harmonic Hexkin. Welcome, welcome. I am having a great weekend. It's been a great weekend. Got to do a local Hex meetup on Friday. Got to rest and relax some on Saturday. Some family time. And Sunday, I was, I literally woke up. And I'm like, I'm going to, I think I need to do a stream. I think it's time. I think I got enough material put together to do it. Bullish stream. Sure, yeah. Self-compassion. Well, I'll take it. I mean, it's not a bear stream, I'll say that. It's a uh, bullish on getting a validator set up stream. Paul Sachs, do you see the PLSX SAC wallet, Max? Uh, 
did something interesting happen? Still the biggest holder and die? Did something? I missed something on Twitter this morning. I, I definitely could have. It's like I, I wake up and I spend like I spend 30 minutes on Twitter and I still miss stuff. And I don't even want to spend that much time, but it ends up that way. All right, let's see uh, how many bodies we got. We got Vince. So we're going to count you as one, but I get the spirit. I like it. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We got seven. If anyone who just made it, I need 10. My body is ready. And we're going to start. So, of course, nine minutes late is sloth. Feel free, sloth. What's up, graphics? Yeah, like I said, I woke up this morning and I was like, I, I should do this. I should do it because I got I got some stuff to talk about. <laughs> I'll allow it. I'll allow it. Number eight. What's up, G Young? Welcome, welcome. Nine and ten. What's up? We got 11, 12 in here. Cool. All right, everyone. Since your bodies are ready, as it was simple. It's a simple thing. I just wanted to, I just want to get the people going, you know, a little bit. And I'll get to questions in a moment as well. So if you have questions, I'll scroll back up and I will uh, address them. But right now I want to get started into the content. So I'm going to first open this up and I'll put the link in the chat so you can follow along. You can ask questions, whatever you like to do. So this is the place where I've been documenting Pretty much, I have like a, a doc where I have a bunch of long form stuff, but this is the concise information on the README. That's what README's are for to describe what the code is and how to do stuff and whatever extra stuff you want to do. Basically, elaboration on the comments uh, that can be in code. And I've updated everything for V4, even though this test set here it is it is V4. And I, yeah, I added a bunch of stuff yesterday. It's like one thing I worked on was uh, I've had Vince and Ju Young and others uh, reach out and I've been helping back and forth on some stuff. And they actually was great feedback for me to understand what problems people are having, what questions they have, what, what things that I think, oh, you know, that's easy. But, you know, for someone who has never did it before, I've been working on this stuff for two or three months. So I started with the Ethereum testnet scripts. A lot of them were originally made for that. And then when Pulse Chain uh, Testnet V3 came out, I just converted a lot of my Ethereum stuff over to Pulse Chain, tested all that, and then V4 came out again, retested it, and I've got a lot of help too from uh, Gamma DevOps's uh, channel, the uh, Pulse, well, his channel, Pulse Dev channel. Shout out to them as well. A lot of good conversations happening in there, so I'd recommend that. I'll put that in the chat if you're not already in there. At least join the Pulse Dev chat if you're if you do Telegram. It goes a lot of conversation and uh, stuff in there going on. So this is the main page. This is, you know, just kind of like a screenshot here of things working. That was for three, that was for V3, um, you know, V4, like I said, is, everything's been updated. And I want to run through, so I'm not going to do a demo on a live server, but I found a, there's an online website where apparently it'll let me download stuff. So I can, at least I can run some of the commands and show you what to do, how this stuff works. So I, I recommend you read all of this, this, uh, I literally I try to put it, you know, all of the things I could think of to help you understand what this stuff does, how to run the script. The first thing is when you run the script, you need your Ethereum fee address where you want the fees to go. So you need to have a wallet that's ready you know, that you control that you can set the, your, your, uh, your, your address to the, so your validators, uh, and the stuff can be paid to, and then your server's IP address. And if this changes, you, you need to update uh, the stuff too, which I have that in the FAQ section. But these are the only two things you need. When I was building the script, these are the only two things that need user interaction as far as that are specific for setting up your server that I found. And yeah, I've tested it. And uh, that's the only two things you really need from a person setting it up. So here's, here's the stuff. There's also scripts to reset the validator. And... I need to I have a space here. Otherwise, that should have been bolded. So there's a script for that that I'll, yeah, this one too. It basically, if you want to run it a few times, I know some people have ran it a few times and now they're getting different errors. That can happen because 
when it creates the service files, for example, it'll just keep appending to the service files and then it'll basically corrupt your service files for the, for the Pulse Chain client stuff. Nothing system-wide, but just for the Pulse Chain stuff. So this is something, if you want to use the reset script, if you're going to run the script over and over, I recommend using the reset script because all it does is if it stops any of the services you got started, it will remove the service files that uh, got created. It will remove the blockchain data and it will remove the user. So it, it tries to make it as if you never ran the script. It, I guess it, it can't do it. It doesn't reverse everything. It doesn't reverse the, the dependencies you installed that the script does and stuff like that. But this will give you an idea of how to reset the client data and all that. To use the script, very important. I didn't want to just let, I mean, maybe I'll change it later, but I thought, hey, I want you to actually read and understand what the script does so you don't run it on accident and it deletes a bunch of your blockchain stuff and you don't want that. So all you have to do to run the script, if you run it as it is, you download it, you run it as it is, it will just say this. It'll say, turn this to true. All you have to do, edit the code really quick, change false to T-R-U-E, true. That's all you need to do. You do that, it'll bypass the check, and then it'll ask you just hit enter to continue and the script will run. Just wanted to put a little safety check in there just so people actually take a look at the code real quick. Super simple edit. You don't need to be a programmer to do this. You literally just got to change this word to true to run the reset script. So again, I'm going to go through this and I'll get to questions in a bit, but I want to run through uh, the meat and potatoes here. So the first thing, so this, all, this script assumes, you know, my, my tagline for it is it does 85% of your validator setup. And I kind of just roughly came up with that number because it does everything except create your deposit keys, which you should do on a different machine anyways, and make your deposit at the launch pad. That's pretty much, it does everything except those two primary things. So that's why I came up with roughly 85%. It automates all dependency installs, it automates getting your services set up, getting your other user to run it as for various uh, security and otherwise reasons. It doesn't do Docker. I know a lot of people have been using uh, a David Feeder script and, and other stuff to do Docker. This one is a not Docker version. There is advantages and disadvantages using Docker to run the clients and just running them all on the same server. There's managed disadvantages to that. I've never set up Docker with clients. So if you have any Docker related questions as far as the clients go, I'm not going to be very helpful because I have not tested that environment. I know how to use Docker. I've kind of helped tr people troubleshoot a little bit with some of the stuff, but I've, I, that's not what my script does. So I'm not going to be able to like be super helpful for that. All right. So the first thing you want to do is when you want to get it on your server, you need to have Git installed on the server, which may or may not be pre-installed already. And if it's not, if you're on Ubuntu, you just do, let's see. So this is this is just like a um, test terminal. This is not a real server. I mean, I don't know. I think it's like an emulation or maybe it's a real server somewhere, but this is just something I could use in the web browser. I'm going to show you all just to kind of type things out. So if you don't have Git installed, then you need to install Git first, look it up for however your operating system works to figure that out. Usually on Ubuntu, Debian type OS is it's apt git install git, for example. But once you already have that, you run this command, git clone and the git URL of the repo. It's basically the repo plus dot git. And that just means download the code on the GitHub repo at this address. So if you do that, now you have Pulse Chain Validator, cool. Oops, not LD, <laughs> LS. And now you have these scripts. So to run these scripts, you may need to make them executable. So if you don't make them executable, they're just, they may be read or write only. And you want them to be executable. Those are three main permissions on Linux, read, write, executable. So if you, you have need to make them executable in order to run the scripts. So to run the script, do that and then whichever one you want to run, Pulse Chain Validator Setup. And then, that, then you should be able to run it. And when you run it again, I'm not going to try to run it on this because I don't know if it's actually going to work. I don't want to go through all the errors, but when you run it like this again, you need to 
give it your Ethereum fee address, again, where you want the fees to go, and your server IP address. So for example, you could just do, you know, whatever it is. So this is your fee address. Address is space, your IP address of the server. So whatever that is, I'm just gonna do random IP address. That's all I doubt. It's not even a valid one, there you go. But put in your, your server's IP address. And that's what you would do and you just hit enter. And it may prompt you once or twice to hit enter when you're installing Rust. I think that, uh, I think that usually pops up, but it should be very little user interaction. You just uh, put that in, dot slash just means run this file after you make it executable, set up, and then your fee address, and then your IP address. Those are the two parameters you need to run it. Then you hit enter and it should work. So I'm not gonna hit enter, I'll just hit control C, but I just wanna show you how that works. And again, if you want to know how this stuff, uh, what it maps to, this is the, again, the fee recipient. These parameters are just going to the different configurations for the clients. So I've just automated all the manual stuff that you need to do as far as the client setup or again, 85% of it. And when you run this, this script has been tested on Ubuntu 22.04. So if you use a different Ubuntu version, it may or may not work. If you use a different Linux OS, it may or may not work. If you use the macro windows, Godspeed. I didn't write any documentation for those. Some of the stuff may work, some of it may not, but Linux is the server OS. It is the gold standard. That's why every cloud provider says, hey, I'll give you a Linux VM because they know it's very repeatable, scalable, and uh, supported in a lot of different ways. And if you're using the cloud, you don't have to use the cloud. There's advantages, everyone screams decentralization, don't want to use the cloud. Well, all the devs are using the cloud. Uh, I, would, I would wager, I don't have all the stats in front of me, but I would wager a good percentage of the validators the devs are going to be running are probably going to be from a cloud service because advantages, they have, they provide, you know, 100% uptime, 99% uptime, you know, all they take care of all of that. They take care of all the utility bills, electricity, all that. And it's just easy to spin them up. It's easy to use Terraform to come up with a configuration for your infrastructure, infrastructure as code type of stuff. That's again, why Pulse Chain devs uh, talk about Terraform and all those templates. It just makes it easier and uh, it has a lot of advantages there. And if you're worried about decentralization for cloud stuff, there's like 10 different cloud providers. You don't have to use AWS. You can set one up up in uh, Google Cloud. There's Oracle Cloud. There's Microsoft's Cloud, Azure. There's IBM Cloud. There's like DigitalOcean, there's a ton of different cloud providers. And within each cloud provider, there's different regions, different basically data centers that you can set up to, to, for them to run in. So you can set up validators in 10 different clouds in 10 different regions for each one if you wanted a little bit more redundancy. But I guess the worry there is just, you know, what if the providers decide to turn off the switch for all the ones that are running Ethereum validators or Pulse Chain validators or however? Well, then, I mean, that that would be a good case for running your own hardware or running or making your own data center like uh, Alex from Hedron. We still need people. I, I hope, I definitely hope not everyone uses the cloud to do their validator, but I think a good portion of people will. And I think that's okay as long as there's a good portion of people who are running their own hardware as well. Anyways, just some pros and cons. So after running the script, it the script automates around 85%, like I said, uh, the only, the only the two major steps, maybe two or three major steps, generate your validator keys with a deposit tool. I should probably link the deposit tool in here as well, but th that's available at, let's see, gitlab.com, pulsechain.com. So do not download and use the Ethereum one. Use the one at the Pulsechain website because the Ethereum one is the one that a lot of people go to. I first tried to use it too, but this is the one made for with the Pulse Chain magic sauce and stuff. So this is the client should be using to generate your things. So again, generate them on a different machine and 
various reasons of why to do that. I actually link a security video in the repo as well on the readme that you can check out. It explains a lot of this stuff. Uh, very cool. I need to finish it myself, but uh, I, he talked about a lot of very important themes for validator security. Shout out David Feeder for sharing that on Twitter. That was uh, super useful in, in order to understand all these concepts. So when you once you generate them, you need to get them over to your validator server. You can use, just like SSH, there's secure copy, SCP. So you can copy them over the network. Uh, I like a little trick that's like, basically makes it copy and paste. So you just base64 encode the zip file of the validator keys, and then you just decode it on your server. You know, I like stuff like that, just you know, cute little trick you can do if you like literally just wanna make a copy and paste style. And then once you run, once you uh, set up the deposit client, make sure to do the setup because that was one thing I ran into. I didn't, I had the V3 one and I downloaded the new one, but I didn't do the setup. And I tried to generate the keys for V4 and it wouldn't work because it installs libraries and stuff on your system. So you actually need to, you know, install the, do the, run the setup, make sure everything's installed if you're trying to go from V3 to V4 as well. And then deposit as SH, create a new monomic and give it the chain ID or not. If you don't set it, it'll ask you during the thing, uh, during the setup, and then just follow the instructions from there. Once you have them from there, again, uh, you, you need to, another gotcha, you need to import the keys as the user that's running the nodes. If you're using the cloud, your default user is gonna be Ubuntu. But with this script, we set up a new user called node user. So when you import them, make sure you import them with the node account and not your Ubuntu account. Otherwise it won't show up when the validator runs. So we have instructions on exactly what to do here for that. And then you can exit that shell. Once you uh, start a shell as a node user, do the import enter your password for each of the validators, then you can exit back to your Ubuntu user if you're using uh, AWS for this. Or if you're just using your own hardware, whatever user this is, you, you, it'll be the same concept. And then you just start the clients. Once you're there, once you got your keys stuff, you start them. However, you do need to wait. It's recommended, unless you wanna get slashed, to wait until all the clients are synced before you make your deposit. 32 million tuples per validator. You could have one validator, 10 validators, 100 validators. I, 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 I've heard plenty, you know, Gamma's talked about 100 validators could be run on one server. I haven't personally tested that, but I think it makes sense. As long as you're, you know, got your hardware uh, right, you may need to, you may need a little bit beefier server than the, than the one I talked about here. But I think the one I talked about here is M2 2X large. It's uh, what, 32 gigs of RAM, 32 or 64 gigs of RAM, uh, four or eight CPUs, and then everything does uh, at least two terabytes of memory to do the blockchain sync, and, or two terabytes of hard drive, hard disk space. So as far as, that's a common question, how many validators can you run? You know, if you happen to be a huge sacrificer and you can actually run, you actually have enough 32 times 100 then that's something you may need to beef up your hardware, but you can probably afford it if you stack that much in the first place. And then once you make the, you make the deposit at Launchpad and after it's synced, again, wait till it's synced, then make your deposit, LC risk, risk getting slashed. And then uh, what it, it should take around 24, up to 24 hours to get your validator activated and participating on the network and you're good to go. So here I have a bunch of debugging stuff, a bunch of commands to check the progress, what this stuff actually means. This is where you are syncing. This is where we want to be. And then those numbers can change and stuff. But some stuff to help you debug if you can't figure out what, this, what all this stuff means. I really hope in the future to make this stuff easier. I think especially once we have validators in a box, maybe Alex from Hedron will make them. Uh, if it's just plug and play, Everything just works. You don't have to worry about it, but we are in the early days of validating. So this is the manual commands you can use to try to figure out what this stuff means. And I forgot to mention too, this is all for 
Geth, aka Go Pulse, and Lighthouse. I've played around with Prism and Aragon before, but this script uses Geth and Lighthouse, and all this, all the commands are sp kind of specific to them. So I don't know much about the other two. I have a few notes, but this is the stuff I've tested. I know it works. I know how to figure this stuff out. Uh, yeah, peering problems and all this stuff too. So that's on the talking to the client side. On the service side, to see what is actually going on, to get look at the debug logs and stuff like that. You can use these commands. You can talk to your, so we created a system. So the script uh, creates uh, system configuration files, which basically just make it easier. You don't need to be connected with a the terminal. They just run. There's a service manager that runs the clients for you. And you can talk to the service manager to get statuses. You can restart the services, Lighthouse Beacon, Geth, all that stuff. And you can see what's going on. You can see, you know, uh, whether, what, you know, what's syncing the new blocks, whether your validator import is working, whether it's activated, sort of all that stuff, or see if there's problems as well. So there's also an EC2 helper script. I mean, it's it's very minimal. It's just like stuff that I think is makes the experience a little bit better. You can put it, you can name it something that's not just a generic host name, L, -val L validator or, or uh, anything else you want. And this just kind of makes it uh, be quiet and kind of update your system, reboot, make sure you get the latest and greatest before you start validating. So don't really need to use it, just something so some of my preferences, I thought I'd put in a script to help people out there. And it's not really specific to EC2 either. It's You can use it on your own box as well. Let's see. And then I've got a bunch of other stuff too. This is AWS. So these are Google Docs I created before during the validator, um, the validator streams I've been doing. This is, it tells you exactly how to create a cloud account, what, you know, what different things you need to do what the um, what the different configurations are for for the boxes, how to create a, a key pair, how to do firewalls in the storage, once the instance instance, and then different stuff to uh, different references that may be helpful as well. And then another doc, I just linked to a bunch of these docs, so like more. Um, how to use exactly a lot of stuff I already put on the readme, but how to exactly use the key management stuff, all that disclaimer. None of this is like use at your own risk. This is not audited code, all that stuff. Audited commands. It's just been my experience going through all this stuff. And then my long form notes, I published some of those two long form notes on the different clients and the setup. Again, I have the most experience with Lighthouse and Geth. However, there are some notes on Aragon and Prism that you may find helpful as well on there. No support on those because I stopped using those in, in favor of the other two. And then monitoring, if you want to set up stuff like that, there's some guys to do it. Uh, I don't have any scripts on it currently. And this is how to set it up for Grafana for you know, more secure access. The commands you can use as well for that. So a little bit of, a little bit of nad, nerd magic going on. And then I've linked to some of the uh, community guides. If I missed any, feel free to let me know. I can throw them on there too. These are the ones I've came across and found helpful. And I know uh, David uh, has a V4 one, I believe he released recently too. This is a security one. Highly recommend everyone watch that. Uh, the guy's very interesting and goes over a lot of cool stuff. And the FAQ. So just some of the common questions I talked about here. And uh, you can see like kind of some troubleshooting as well, just some light stuff. And if you're doing all this stuff, you really should be in a chat room for people to help you and for you to help other people and share ideas and stuff. So feel free to do that. And these are all just a ton of references of things I've came across to help me better understand how to be a validator. With that being said, I'll put on the FAQ and we'll just briefly go through the code. I went through the code before explaining everything in, in another stream. So I won't go through too heavy this time. I literally went line by line last stream. I won't go too heavy. These are just comments on a lot of stuff I already have on the readme, but I kind of like to make scripts stand alone by themselves. If everyone, if someone doesn't have access to it. So I did that. You can change the name of the node user to anything you want. Feel free. 
I just I just made it Node because it's very generic and talks about what it does. And then this is the chain we're using. Different clients like to have it different ways. Be careful with that. That's something you may come across. Why isn't this working? And because some use underscore and some use dashes. Fun. Love problems that you, you're sitting, bang your head for 30 minutes trying to figure out because it was just a, a slightly different naming convention. These are the app packages that gets installed for dependencies for all the stuff. The different directories where we keep data, uh, blockchain data, and where we're pulling from on the repos and checkpoint URL to make things uh, sync faster and stuff too. Again, when you run the script, I've timed it a couple times. It takes some, like sometimes it takes 20 minutes, sometimes it takes 40 minutes. So yeah, I set it on, it takes around 30 minutes plus or minus, depending on you know, your bandwidth, server specs, if you run into errors, things like that. And the first step it installs uh, the different packages and sets up Golang and Rust for you. So the clients will work. So it does all this stuff, generates uh, your uh, shared secret for the clients to talk to each other, adds your user. That was the second one. Step three is just sets up the uh, Go Pulse and gets it to start syncing. Some interesting things I had to do here to make this work smoothly in a script. Not very important, but uh, took me some time to debug it. To say, hey, I need to slow down a minute to get this uh, script to work better. And then this is the system service it creates. All the guides you look at will have some kind of skeleton version of this to tell you, show you what to do. And this is just an automated way of putting into a file for you. And then reloading stuff so it can start running. Step four, setting up Lighthouse. So the only thing with Lighthouse, because you need to sync the blockchain and you need to make your deposit before it actually starts working, then I, I guess I could actually better word this of you can start it. Actually, yeah, I guess you, you could start it and let it uh, start uh, doing stuff while, so it starts syncing before you make your deposit. So yeah, that could be a little improvement I could do there, but not a big deal. I just uh, funny all these like little things you come across when you're reading reading your own code and, and seeing how it works again. And then this is just some little tricks, make all this stuff work. And then we start doing the beacon service. And this is where your IP address goes in because it needs that. And your fee recipient, your ETH address goes here. Again, boot nodes, uh, uh, Brett Pulsechain Dev recently told me this may not be necessary anymore. It helped me a lot in V3 to get peers and stuff running. However, in V4, uh, maybe it's not necessary. So, um, I mean, it still works with it in there, but maybe get removed at some point. And for your beacon service or for your validator service. So you have your Lighthouse beacon service, your Lighthouse validator service, and you have your geth on the execution side. And that also has your fee recipient. And yeah, this is just, again, just some script magic to make all this stuff work. And step five is to open your firewall on your local machine. If you're doing this AWS, you also need to open your, uh, the main firewall, the security groups, they call it, and get these in there as well. But I have docs on that on the uh, reference on the readme to talk about the firewall on the AWS side. So you need to do this on the local side at least do it if you're using AWS. At least do it on your on the global side. But uh, if you're running your own uh, hardware and stuff, you probably need to do this on the local side as well, depending on how the default configuration is, whether it's default deny and allow and all that stuff. It doesn't hurt to do it anyways. And then this just tells you what you need to do afterwards, and you're good. So if you run it and you come across errors, then you can start debugging what those errors are but I've had many successful runs with it. And yeah, my validators seem to be working fine. Uh, after, you know, it takes a while. First you gotta sync everything, that takes a day or two. Then you got to wait to be activated, which takes up to a day usually. So it can take around three days to get everything synced and be validated on the network and all that stuff. Where are we at? All right. So with that, I will go into questions. Make a note real quick. There's plenty of questions in the chat. Oh, 
talked about a lot of stuff. So scrolling up. Tommy Villas, get on you legend. Get OB is term we use West Grant meaning enjoy the rifles. Nice man, appreciate that. Appreciate it. Is your body a wonderland? I uh I try. I try to keep my body healthy, wealthy, and wise. Let's see. Can't do 100x stupid wells, 84. Oh, you know. yeah, people are going to sell. People are going to sell from uh, time to time. Good luck with the hunt. We met our own luck. I like that UFO. I like that. Exactly, compassion. Opportunity and preparation equals uh, success. No luck needed. There you go. Claudio de Lucia. I, I can see my validators deposited, but I can't see if it's working. So it sounds like your validator state is in pending. If you made the deposit, it should go to pending, but you can't see if it's working. So if it still says pending, it means it's not active yet. And if you refresh, I think I have, yeah, I talked about that too. Yeah, here we go. This, this FAQ is for you right here. So there's the other debugging section of stuff you can go through as well. Let's see is up here, yeah. So if you wanna see if it's working locally, you can do this. If you set up the monitoring stuff, maybe that'll help as well with, with Grafana, but you can see if it's help, helping uh, working locally there. But if you wanna check your validator on the network to see what the network thinks is going on, as far as just like status wise, then you can just use this URL uh, as an example. So this is just one of the validators on the network, just randomly picked it. And you can see it's active. So deposited, well, after it's deposited, it will go to pending. It can sit in pending for you know, 16, 18, 24 hours. And then it becomes active once everything goes good. If it's online, if you know everything uh, is working properly. Exited uh, is just, yeah, validate misbehaves or choose to leave the network. So I, I haven't been in exited status before. There could also be another status. What is it like? A, like some kind of red, it's like problem or inactive. Maybe it's inactive, we'll say. And that would mean something's wrong. Your clients aren't working or you're not synced yet. That's what I'm saying. Sync the clients before you make the deposit. So otherwise you may get slashed until your client is actually working after blockchain is synced. If that makes sense. real quick so you can check that out and see but to your question of again this is not my validator this is just one I'm using as an example if it's working it'll be active that's how you know it's working it's it's participating in attest testing and proposing blocks and all that good stuff so that's how, that's how you know that. If you have a follow-up question, let me know. Why don't you get a custom punk design like graphics or most hex influencers? What is a punk? Custom punk. Is that a form of clothing I'm not aware of? Custom punk? Yeah, let me know what that means. I do have... I am making a t-shirt. I'm in the process of making a new, uh, I had one run at making t-shirts and I don't like the material. So I want to try it again with a different uh, outfit and see, see what it looks like. So scroll down. Super shout out to Ju Young the Hexkin, by the way, runs hsiwatch.com and potentially other products and other services. So uh, in the future, so future's bright for uh, this gentleman and all the, all the cool stuff the community is making. So Lily Lack, since V4 was released, what is the current expected APF for running a validator? Was it originally 3% sitting the higher? I, you know, it's a good question. I think the ideal now 
I'm just speculating because we don't have all the information because there's no like wiki. You can find all this official information because it's kind of just like what people talk about, what they understand right now, who's talking to devs, have the devs decided on this, all this stuff. So it's, it's hard to speak in like official terms. So I'm just speculating. I believe before it was a fraction of that at full capacity too. So I guess the easy way to understand it is like maybe before at best you would get three or 4%. And now with V4 at best, you'll get 30 to 40%. However, a lot of that goes down. I believe I saw it recently. It's already at 20%. And we I don't think we have very much over 4K validators that are going burr. So it is significantly higher than V3. I don't know what the exact numbers are yet, though. I don't, I've not confirmed the exact numbers, but I think the idea was to take it from a fraction of a percent to some significant percent number. I'll say that. Don't know what those numbers are but I think uh, that's, that's an okay way of explaining it. So you get the idea. Ohm fee is a validator interface flawless or something still needing to get fixed added. Not sure what validator interface is. I, I guess you would be talking about the clients, how they're working and all that. All the clients are working. I mean, I mean people got validators up and running now. I'm sure they're still if on the pulse dev telegram channel i'm sure there's still a few things on the list of things to get fixed but i haven't seen anything major they're all just hey this is test net it's for testing we're finding these little things here and there i assume there's still a list of uh some minor things that will that will come across but nothing uh but values are working and you know if i'm able to write a script if me and other people are able to write scripts to automate this stuff and it works then it's definitely working good enough as far as that goes. My body needs more than one cup of coffee than I'm ready. Hope you've got caffeinated in the last half hour graphics. Uh, yeah, yeah, we definitely, definitely, this will be one of the most technical streams as far as uh, code and validating stuff goes. What's up, Archie? Welcome, welcome. Hexformer, welcome as well. Yeah, again, go to the Pulse Dev. If, if you, if you, some people don't do Telegram, whatever, it's cool. But if you want, if you do, and you're interested in, in chatting about validator stuff, Pulse Dev is one of the places to be. <sighs> Build a full stack web app, API server without breaking sweat. I know, I know, man, like there's different technologies. I've, I've luckily been exposed to so many different ones, you know, working in, in tech for so long. You know, I, I've, I guess you could say I've mastered Windows, Mac, Linux, all different versions of, of and everything in between different software running on them containers. Like I know about all that stuff. So uh, it's funny. Like it's, I mean, I still come across about actually that's, that's a great point. Like when I started learning about validators in January, I was doing Ethereum stuff. I was trying to figure that out in preparation. I was, I was, I didn't know how this stuff worked. Like it really takes a lot of time and mental energy and understanding to figure out this stuff. And that's how I got from, like, what is a client? What does the client even mean? I got from that to I'm writing, I'm automating scripts. I'm helping people, you know, uh, set up validators with automated scripts. But that took me a good while. It took me at least, I'd say a couple months before I felt like I have a, have a pretty confident understanding I can help people, uh, other people with it. Uh, was there a, ever a confirmation, David Feeder, this video made on the hardware needed for validator works? I'm not sure. Are you saying he, he had a video talking about hardware and wondering if that hardware was the right configuration to do? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I don't think much has changed as far as I would say minimum 32, 64 gigs of RAM. You need at least two terabyte disk space. And, you know, pretty good CPU. Uh, or virtual CPUs if you're using cloud. Besides that, you just need to stay online and uh, get it set up correctly. That's the biggest thing. What's up, Steve D? Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Hope to see you uh, at a meetup sometime too. It's been a while. Godfather J6, how are you, sir? Good to see you. Win mainnet. Watch my stream with Corey. 
yesterday. I'm bullish on mid-May. I try not to talk about it. I try. Not, it's, it's been a long time since I was. I had any confidence that we were actually close to launching. But recent developments have made me bullish. Could be wrong. Nobody knows, but it's looking good. Let's see. Can I use a VPS instead of having hard? Yeah. So VPS, pr pretty much analogous to the cloud data center. VPS, I mean, could be, it's just a data center somewhere. A cloud is like a collection of data centers. Think about it like that. So the regions, each data center is a region kind of. So yeah, you definitely can. And I have all the ducks on how to do that. Yeah, let's see. This doc right here will tell you exactly how to, how to get your hardware set up on AWS. I'm going to drop it in the chat. I did so many of these uh, pulse chain depth plain and validator AMAs. Like I'm, I'm compounding on the knowledge. I'm compounding on the docs I've already shared. It's pretty cool, actually. Like it makes my job a lot easier. Not having to think of, think of all this stuff at once and write it all. Oh, I've already wrote, I've already wrote down the process. So it's like the Naval quote: "There is no later. There's only now." So don't use that to stress yourself out. But if you say, "Oh, I'll do that later." What if you did it now? What if you did it right now? And then thank yourself. Your future self will thank you. You know. Got my uh, hope cup out. Special edition. Special edition hope cup. Juyang, can I set up this? Can I, can this setup run multiple validators? Great question. Yes. So the script. If you notice, the script doesn't ask you how many validators you want to set up. It just asks you your fee address and your IP address. So how you determine how many validators you want to set up is with the deposit client. So when you run the deposit client, yeah, when you run the deposit client, it'll ask you how many validators you want to set up and how many keys uh, to generate, all that stuff. So that's all the deposit client side. And then once you upload it, or once you import them into Lighthouse, then Lighthouse is like, cool, you want to be one validator. Cool, you want, you gave me five. Cool, you gave me 10, give me a hundred, whatever it is. And then once you get a launch pad, it'll ask you how many you're doing. You do that, you, uh, you upload your deposit file, JSON deposit file, and then you do a transaction for each validator. So if you have five, you do five transactions, 10, and so on. Great question. What's up, Francis? I love Jesus. Welcome, welcome. How do you run multiple on one machine? Uh, yeah, it's a little counterintuitive, isn't it? So just like I said on how to how to do all generate all those with your deposit client, the only thing about it like this. Think about the only real barrier for you running multiple validators on one machine is do you have enough PLS or TPLS to deposit into the contract? Do you have enough? Do you have 32 million times X? X equals five, X equals 10, 100. That's the only, that's the, like the number one barrier. Do you have enough to actually run those validators? If you do, I'm not, I haven't tested hundred validators, but I would, if I, if I were going to run hundred validators, I would probably beef up my, my specs a little bit because, you know, that could be more processes running more memory usage. It, it could lead to stuff like that. I'm not sure exactly how it grows. If it grows exponentially, if it grows linearly, I'm not sure because I haven't ran that many validators. So if I were going to run 50, if I was going to run at least maybe 50 validators, I would probably do a larger instance, a beefier hardware. If I were going to run 5, 10, 15, 20, I think that'd be fine with kind of like the minimum specs. You know, again, 34, 64 gigs of RAM, two terabyte hard drive, and a pretty good CPU. So just think about it like that. Do you, first of all, 
do you have the PLS to, to, to run that many? And if you're just going to run up to 10, I wouldn't worry about your specs. It should run fine. What does it mean to get slashed? Another great question. So when you misbehave in some way, if you're offline, you know, that could be your blockchain's not synced or it could be a power loss, whatever. If something happens where you're not reliable on the network, they could take uh, PLS, you, you know, you stop earning fees. They could take some from your balance. Um, I haven't, yeah, I haven't actually got slashed before, but I'm, I'm trying to think of all the different ways it can happen. But essentially, uh, you could start losing some of your, uh, some of your, uh, I think some of your principal. You can lose some of your principal and kind of you have to like build that back up. Yeah, I think if it drops below a certain level, you need to, uh, like you need to re up, maybe. I'm not sure actually. It's a good question. Don't get slashed. How about that? I'm sure there'll be some explainer video on that too, but I believe it can come at your principal. I think I saw when I was getting slashed before that happened. And you can't drop below a certain amount, but I mean, you got, if it's 32 million pulse, the, the amount you have to drop below, you have to get slashed for a long time, I suspect, before that becomes a real problem. So when you would go to withdrawal, then I guess you, 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 know, you would only withdraw whatever you put in there minus the slashing, I suspect. The chat of Donner Schwantz, best avatar in the business. What's happening, man? Welcome, welcome. Another great question from Lily Lyak. Geth, Lighthouse, Aragon, Prism. Do we need to set up validator for all these? What is the benefit of running validator for each one? I don't understand. Yeah, good question. So you need to pick two. You have two different execution clients available. You have Geth and Aragon. Geth is GoPulse on the Pulse Chain side. I think we should call it GPLS, but it looks like it's going to happen. It looks like it's going to be Geth. So, and then you have two consensus clients. You have Lighthouse and Prism. Those are the four clients that Pulse Chain devs have forked and made work for Pulse Chain. So you don't need to run all four. You just need to run a pair of those. So you could run Geth uh, Lighthouse, like what uh, my script does. You could run Geth Prism, like I think other people's script does. You could run Aragon uh, Lighthouse, you know, stuff like that. So you just need to pair a execution client with a consensus client, which has your beacon and your validator uh, programs. And those are things you need to run on a validator. A valid, just think about a validator as a server. Your validator is a server. There's a little bit of can, like naming difference because there's also a validator client within Lighthouse and there's a beacon client too. So but at, at, just think about it like this, your validator is a server and in that server, you have clients. You And for this script, for example, you have Geth and Lighthouse. So you run Geth as your execution client on your validator server and you run Lighthouse beacon and validator client on your validator server. So you just need to pick two clients, run those, and that, that will enable you to participate on the network with your validator server. That's why I say validator server a lot because your validator is your server unless you're talking about a specific part of the consensus client, which we're usually not talking about because it's not that important to bring up. Make sense? If not, let me know. But uh, I think that's I think that's a good way to explain it. That FOMO. What makes sense if running more than a hundred validators? AWS versus hardware. Good question. Hmm. For me, AWS just makes everything so easy. You know, I built plenty of servers. I built or I put together server. I've started servers. I built plenty of computers. At least I'll say. What What is a server? It's a special. It's a special, you know, some servers, you could run anything as a server, technically as server software, but there, you know, there's some builds of computers that have, that are, have hardware specifically built to be good at being a server. So there's that. If you have a hundred validators, like I said, I would err on the side of a more beefy machine 
So maybe 64 gigs of RAM instead of 32, stuff like that. However, in AWS, if you want to do 100 validators, that's as simple as instead of doing a uh, M2 2x large, maybe you do an M2 4x large, which I believe is a 64 uh, gigabyte configuration. So I'll just scroll up to, yeah. So this is the one that's 32. This is kind of like the minimum. Uh, and so why would you run the minimum, by the way? I usually don't like to run the minimum of this stuff. Like if I'm going to do something, I wanna, I'd want i rather not deal with stuff not working later because I skimped out on hardware. However, again, AWS Cloud makes this very easy. If you do this and it doesn't work, well, then you just tear it down and you just do a 4X large instead of a 2X large. And that just gives you, I think it's more more vCPUs, it gives you more uh, memory. So why would you do the minimum two? Because you pay more for the higher specs. I don't know exactly the price difference between running a 2X large and 4X large, but I'm pretty sure I would estimate it's probably at least 25% higher. So if you're paying estimate, let's see, I'm just, I haven't, I don't have any concrete numbers. I'm just thinking of like what my bills have looked like so far. You can expect to pay by running this maybe $400 per month or so, 400, 400, 300, 400, 500, somewhere through there, running a validator with this configuration. But if you ran one with a Forex large, you know, that could be 500, 600, $700, that kind of thing. So that's why you kind of want the minimum that it'll do. But for 100 validators, yeah, I think if I was doing 100 validators, I may do a Forex large just to, just in case, because I have a feeling that's going to be, uh, it's going to take, but I haven't tested it. So that's why I don't have any concrete answers for you on that. Bobby Hexelrod, what's happening, man? Has anyone guesstimated the ROI timeline for each validator? Well, it's more than it used to be. I'll say that V4 has been bullish for validators for sure. So ROI is, it sounds like what you're saying is how much before it pays off your validator. I think a lot of things depend on that. I think there's the price appreciation for earning PLS, for example. And it depends on, are you paying monthly? Are you using the cloud and you're paying monthly? Or, you know, you're paying, let's say 400 bucks a month. Or are you building your own hardware? Maybe it's 2K up front and you pay for electricity. So I don't know how much that would be, wherever you live. Maybe 50 bucks, could be a hundred bucks, whatever. For having a computer server on 24 seven. So you got to factor that in. It's hard to say. I think we're definitely made huge strides toward being profitable before with V3. I was like, I don't care. I just, I, you know, I want to help the community do this. I don't care if it's profitable or not. I want to be, you know, have utility. I want to, you know, help, help secure the network, all that stuff. So it really didn't matter to me as much, but when V4 happened, I was like, whoa, I think, you know, people have actually have a chance to make money being a validator. So uh, hard to say how much it would, it would take to pay off again. What if PLS goes down for a while? What if, what if then it goes up for a while? You know, I would say if you, if you think Pulse Chain is going to do well over the next two years and you plan on being a validator over the next two years, I wouldn't worry so much about the ROI. Price appreciation is probably going to, if you believe it's going to do well, logically, the price appreciation would make up for your upfront costs or monthly bills and stuff. Not financial advice. I'm just saying, if you think it's going to do well, you could uh, consider that. Let's see, Dixon Cider, bro. Why well, want to be able to long hex on the raise to mainnet? Also, want to short it after, like buy the rumor, sell the news. Fiat won't be allowed to. Too. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I mean, I don't. Yeah, the, not everything is going to launch at once. I think people are going to be wanting to use liquid loans, power city, and stuff to mint stables. When are they going to launch? Could be weeks afterwards. I certainly hope they launch as quickly as possible. Uh, because they're definitely products that I like and I know a lot of people in the ecosystem want to use and, you know, hashtag never selling, right? It's a pure, you know, obvious utility in the community. So hopefully there'll be, uh, hopefully the products that we all want to use fiat and otherwise will be available shortly after launch. Do you think a validator dash will be released in the future? Uh, I mean, we kind of have one. 
I don't know what, if you define validator dashboard as far as, are you talking about for each validator having monitoring and metrics? Because that you could, a lot of people are doing that with Grafana and Prometheus. Are you talking about a dashboard like this where you can see, you look at validators, see active ones. What is there? Isn't there a um, leaderboard? Validator leaderboard. Yeah. I think um, And there's deposit leaderboard where you can see. Whoa. Is that, is that 300? Somebody doing, it looks like 100. It's a lot of validators. Yeah, yeah, somebody, I saw that. Somebody did 100 validators recently. That's cool. And there's, yeah, more. And then 62, 20, 10, 10, 10. Yeah, so you see people doing different different uh, kinds of, different number of validators here. So. so yeah, I'm not sure what kind of validator, like you're looking for what kind of information be on the dashboard UFO, but we have some resources right now. Of course, man. Excellent people doing excellent work. They get, they get shout outs. Do you think Pulse Chain will come out anytime? Uh, like anytime like today or anytime like it could be anytime. Like I said, what's the, what's, type in RH Max Quarry Costa or RH Max Power City IO. I talked to Matt a couple days ago too from Power City, formerly from Liquid Lungs, but uh, Power City and talked about it. And in the stream earlier, I said bullish on mid May. So there's that. Let's see. I'm trying to catch up, everyone. I'm trying to catch up. But, oh, where are you at? Hour. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to probably wrap up the next 15 minutes. So get your questions in. It's really fun, though. I had a good time. Hope you all had a good time, too. I, I, I really, it's good to be able to kind of walk through your thoughts and, um, of course, help you all with it, too. It's cool. What's up, Crypto Truth? Good day, my friend. Good day to you, Mumbles. Good day. What's up, Franklin? What's Gucci? Yeah. What's Gucci? What's uh, what's Prada? What's I'm talking about? I was thinking about some luxury brands today. What's uh, there's all kinds of crazy ones that have less pronounceable names. Uh, Franklin, you know, I said Grafana. That's a great question. I messed around a little bit. I was actually figuring out, I was like, oh, can I write a script to automate this? But there's a lot of stuff that needs manual and it's kind of hard to automate. So I kind of just left it for now because it's not, to me, it's not really a priority to work on it because it's, I mean, it's, it's optional. It's nice to have monitoring and see graphs and charts and stuff. However, I mean, this is pretty cool too. I mean, there's, there's some pretty, like you can look at your own validator and uh, look at this stuff too. However, there are some good guys. This is the best guide I've seen and I've came across for setting it up. So yeah, just check it, check, uh, check the repo out on, I'll drop the link here. And I put some nuance to it, some little tricks and stuff if you want to check that out. But I haven't, I haven't set it up on mine and I've kind of deprioritized it for now just because it's, it's, it's optional, but it is, it's nice to have. Really like what a pride difference between cloud. I think I just covered this. Yeah, I think I just covered it. But uh, essentially, you could say maybe it's four or five hundred dollars a month for running it in the cloud. No initial upfront cost, just monthly cost because you're renting a server, and you have your own hardware. Maybe it's a two k, one, two, three k. You know, however you get your hardware, beefy setup, all that stuff, and then you pay electricity bills. Maybe fifty hundred bucks a month. So you kind of gotta yeah weigh those two. Advantages, disadvantages. I, I like the cloud because it's just easy to spin stuff up, tear it down. I can, you know, I don't, I don't have to get download the ISO images, install my own stuff. I just say, hey, I want this thing. It gives it to me. Don't have to worry about the uptime. Don't have to worry about utility bills. So there's advantages there. But I, like I said before, I hope, I certainly hope not everyone uses the cloud because I do like having, you know, it'd be nice if we had thousands of servers that were not using the cloud and thousands of servers that were. So if imaginary horrible, Amazon's like, 
screw crypto, you know, turn off all the stuff. Then at least we have plenty of validators to make sure we're good. They're not running there, you know. Let's see. Just Toddle. Welcome to the party. Welcome to the party. Franklin says, does network settings matter on your machine if you need to suddenly move? If you need to suddenly move. Okay. So if your IP address changes, so that's one thing you need to pay attention to is your, if your IP address changes, then you should update the uh, the script and stuff on your computer. Um, but if you're if you're offline, assume you're going to get slashed a little bit. But if your IP address changes, if you need to move somewhere, your IP address changes, just make sure you update your validator so that your lighthouse, for example, knows about that. But you know, if you get slashed, I mean, if you get if you get twenty million or thirty two million PLS, and you get slashed five PLS, you know, it doesn't matter that sort of thing. So, um, just make sure you you keep your validator up to date with IP address. If you need if it needs to be down for a day or two. I don't think it's, I wouldn't think it's a big deal, but we haven't tested any of this stuff yet. So it's hard to see what, what it's going to look like on mainnet. So yeah, hopefully that, that, let me know if that answers your question. Intense Taekwondo. I like that name. Is there a guide to run the code in a terminal using windows? Not my guide. And I'm trying to think, I don't think I've seen any windows or Mac guides because I really recommend people just use Linux. I love Mac. And I don't really like Windows, but I love Mac, for example, but I would not run, I would not use Mac as a server. I wouldn't use Windows as a server either. Uh, Linux is the server OS. It is, you could run it as desktop too, but it is the de facto server in my mind, my preferences and stuff. And, you know, everything is easier with, as long as you know how to use Linux, everything is easier. So I would recommend people do that. When they ran the issue. Yeah, I covered uh, a little bit of like how to clone the repo and how to uh, change the mode, Gmod, change the mode to executional and stuff like that uh, in the beginning of the stream. Let's see. Dixon Sider, how do you like my idea of Richard making a wallet sack to accept only incentive token? <laughs> I've heard about that. I've heard that idea floating around. But He's already said incentive token is his least favorite and least what he's going to spend time on. That's the only caveat I would be like, he doesn't, it's, it's not like we've saw Richard like, and incentive token, it's, it's, it's my baby that no one's, you know, that we're not, it's not like, you know, he's talked about it in this, in this slide of he really wants to make it into an amazing coin. I think it'll be amazing anyways, just because it's paired with everything else and it's a Richard Hart product. But I, I, that would be interesting. Um, so if you think that, you know, if you're able to do LP, you're able to get incentive token and, and farm it. You know, of course, all those steps. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think it needs that to be not, I don't think it needs that to be a forever dump token. I think, I don't think it'll be a forever dump token anyways. k for k has a great video on incentive token and inflation and stuff. I don't think any rich art coin is going to be a dump forever token. Like he just, does, it's just not his brand. He just doesn't make it. So I'm sure there's some mechanics, some of which we know about, some of which we, maybe we don't know about, but that will make it into um, not a, not a loser token. I don't, I, I wouldn't expect it to be a loser token. I think it'll, and people may build on it too. I think that's something. What if the Maximus guys are like, we're building staking for incentive token, you know, uh, just pure speculation, just throwing it out there. What if Alex from Hedron's like, I like incentive token. I want to make sure it's valuable. You know, what if the people who see an opportunity for an undervalued coin who have dev skills or can hire them, what if they want to build on it? People tend to do what's in the best interest, you know, for, for, for their money in that way, which can lead to building some pretty cool stuff. Franklin, minimum pricing is what, uh, what was the pricing for this minimum ADBS? You know, I don't have exact numbers, but I'm going to go with, I think it's safe bet is around $400 a month. I would say three, four, 500, somewhere through there. I don't have exact numbers yet. 
I need more time to, to get like monthly bills and like keep them consistently running. But I would say it's in, in that ballpark, frankly. Anyone know anything about the ink? Uh, yeah, like I said, the K4K is a great video. Check that out. K4K incentive token. I, I learned a lot from that video. We'll definitely, we, we'll definitely be talking about it uh, for a while. It's, incentive token uh, is interesting. What's up, Frosty Dog? Welcome, welcome. I hope this doesn't turn into a Heaven's Gate cult. I don't know what a Heaven's Gate cult is. However, Dixon Cider has a point. Let's see. You realize that RH hasn't been seen or heard by audio in like four months? I would say three months. So January is like end of January was Hex Conference. So that would be February, March, April. I would say three months. And I'm not sure what the point is, though. Is, is this one of these conspiracies that, like, you know, he's not alive or something? I think uh, I think he's doing fine. I think he likes to be alive. I think uh, he likes it so much. Longevity research, you know. So I think he's I think he's good. I think we're all good. Did you claim your weight token yet? Well, I don't talk about my bags in particular, Frosty Dog. However, I do like that team. I do like that team. Appreciate that, man. Appreciate it. Well, I'm almost caught up with the chat. Got like five more minutes here, and I'm going to grab some lunch. Why doesn't he do you stream? I don't know. I miss him, though. I wish he would. So I suspect for mainnet, we'll be seeing more Richard. I think he's uh, just busy right now. Thank you, Franklin. Good questions. <laughs> Thanks, you. I, I like that catchphrase. If you want the facts... Watch RH Max. I like that. I try. I try not to, you know, I don't talk about stuff I don't like. I don't, uh, I don't ad hominem. I try not to ad hominem people. I don't like personal attacks. I don't, I don't turn this into a holy war. I don't, um, I try to, you know, think before I speak all that. I'm not, not perfect. However, this is not the uh, pump it to the moon channel and hopium channel. This is the, uh, Maybe we talk about stuff that helps you out channel. How about that? Don't be a validator. The upfront cost like 2K better be about let's change validator only. I'm not sure. Let's see. I'm trying to get I'm trying to get a point from this. So don't be a validator. Okay, it is. I mean, we're just do the cloud like we talked about. It only makes sense to be a validator if you have loads of pulse chain like people. You need 32 million. I'll, actually, I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't say. 100 mil is like a load, I guess. It was like 10K or so. I think there's plenty of people we probably have around that amount. So I don't know. APY seems to make it more attractive. So I think they're, um, again, if you think Pulse Chain is going to do good, you will be a validator for a couple of years. You can do the math and figure that out. Doesn't mean, yeah, if you can. So in the cloud, it's interesting. It's, it's, um, Interesting to do that in the cloud, but if you have your own hardware, it should be easier. It's in, your ISP could change it though. It's hard to get like a static IP address depending on your environment and configuration. So I wouldn't rely, I wouldn't say this is an IP address, it's never gonna change. You should probably check it every once in a while to see if it changed and then update your client if it has, or if there's an option for whatever service you're using that assigns your computer or your, your gateway an IP address, See if you can make it static. I don't think everyone can do that, but if it's possible, you can do that. Now your internal IP address being static is different. Your NAT IP address, your you know 192, 168, all that stuff, that's not your external IP address. That's your internal. So that can be static. You can your one computer on your network can have the same IP address for years. However, your external IP address is oftentimes at the whims of your ISP. So um, you have to do some research on that one. It's, Depends on your environment and stuff, but uh, good, good, uh, good uh, question. Let's see, Icosa, love Icosa. Cannot see myself unstaking my Icosa or burning my Watts. So good. What's up, Rob? Got here late. How much to validate makes per month? I did not cover that. 
So I don't know. It depends on how much PLS costs and how much the APY is uh, when everyone's on the network and that could go up or down. So that is an open question right now. Open question. Hey, I made it all the way down to the chat. Cool. All right. Uh, let's see. Yeah. There's, yeah, there you go. There, if you sir, look on look at my channel, I did a. Uh, actually, I, it's funny enough. I called it. I posted the day of because I, I thought I thought B four may come out last Monday. It didn't, but I, I was kind of thinking that because you know I saw I've been looking at the indicators and the different domains getting registered and stuff. So then I think Wednesday was it Wednesday it came out I believe, and that morning I was like, okay, it's been Tuesday. It didn't come out. I was like, all right, Wednesday. I'm going to set the, this video about uh, vintage RH not tweeting, uh, you know, why it's good. He doesn't tweet. I'm going to set this on Wednesday because if it, if, if V4 launches today, you know, it's going to be, it's going to look cool for timing. And it happened. And I was like, Oh, that's cool. I think somebody commented on the video too. Like, Oh, you, you know, referencing uh, that, that happening. So that was pretty cool. I sort of called V4 on the day. <laughs> I mean, it was total guess and I didn't make it public, but uh, first I thought it was Monday and then I was like, I'll set the video to come out on Wednesday just in case it'd be funny. I could have set any video that talked about that stuff to come out any day that week. And, you know, anyways, that was interesting. I, oops, I meant to click on this one. Rain Mac, I want to be a validator, support the network. Yeah, that's what I say too. How long have you been in crypto? Is it true that sell in May and walk away? <laughs> I'm sure that plenty of people will sell in May and walk away. Uh, that's, they're probably mad that Pulse Chain didn't launch for two years and it's kind of a move of frustration, but they say not to make decisions when you're angry, right? So how long have we been in crypto though? Uh, since 2016, yeah, 2016. Started following Richard 2017. So, oh wow. All right, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the stream. Hope you got your uh, validator kick I can't promise I'll be able to answer all your questions or all this stuff, but again, go to t.me slash pulse dev. If you like telegram and you like to chat with people talking about validator stuff, I'm sure uh, it sounds like uh, David and I'm sure Gamma is going to come out with some more content and tutorials and stuff too. I'll walk through as much as I could today. Uh, and hopefully it was useful. I feel like if you, you know, understood all the stuff I talked about and went through and you have the code here, you should be have what you need to get a validator set up and running. I think so. I think so. So with that, appreciate everyone. Sci vibe and five 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 five. I am out.